Okay, so this afternoon I'm talking to Mr. Edmund Bong, who is a lawyer practicing in Kuala Lumpur, and he was also Malaysia's representative to the ASEAN Intergovernment Commission on Human Rights from 2016 to 2018. He is also the founder of the Malaysian Center for Constitution and Human Rights. Edmund has actually done some work in Sabah, and he knows Sabah quite well. Thank you very much for coming, Edmund. I understand you actually used to go to Sabah yes. quite often, is it? <laughs> yeah. I think I, nice? <laughs> I saw you uh, giving a couple of talks in Sabah. Anyway, the purpose of this afternoon for this podcast is basically uh, I'm trying to get a, a professional such as yourself to talk about the Malaysia agreement from the Peninsula Malaysia perspective. I'm sure you're well aware that this is a highly contentious and uh, and that's what they call heated uh, uh, debate in East Malaysia. Basically, the argument is along the lines that uh, people are unhappy with the state of federal state relationships. Uh, they feel that the federal government has not lived up to its promises of giving uh, autonomy to Sabah and Sarawak on the one hand. And secondly, uh, Putrajaya has not respected the so-called position or equal position of Sabah and Sarawak. But leaving that aside to, to one, one part, let's start and talk about the legal aspects of it. Uh, what I want to hear from you is that what is your opinion? Huh? What is your legal opinion? Uh, obviously, Malaysia agreement is an international agreement. And there are some groups in Sabah and Sarawak who said that uh, if there's going to be any legal remedy, since it is an international uh, document, uh, why don't we litigate under international law? Can I have mm. your legal opinion on whether this is possible or not possible? Or if it is possible, uh, you know, what is the angle of this legal argument? Uh, thanks, James. This is actually not new. We have been speaking about it for many years and I understand the sentiment in Sabah, especially when it comes to elections and a lot of politicians speaking about trying to litigate and trying to talk about restoring the rights of Sabah and uh, the people of Sabah and Sarawak. Mm. So what I'm going to say is not new, but I think it's good that you have asked me this question and, and this video can be recorded and I think we can even share it. The, the, we have to go back to a bit of history. One, in 1963, when we admitted the new states, there was that Malaysia Agreement. But then when that Malaysia Agreement was signed, it was then subsumed as part of the Constitution, our Constitution, our Federal Constitution. So if you look at the Federal Constitution, it's very clear that it respects the Malaysian Agreement. It treats the Malaysian Agreement as an international treaty. It's expressly said in the Federal Constitution. However, what is important is that you look at how the terms of that Malaysia Agreement have also been then translated into the Constitution. So the Malaysian Agreement is not a standalone document in the Constitution. The Malaysian Agreement now, while it being subsumed into the Constitution, certain parts of the Malaysia Agreement have also been expressly embedded in the Constitution. And those are the things that we need to look at. We cannot look at the Malaysian Agreement as a standalone agreement. So when people talk about it in terms of going to court to litigate the Malaysian agreement, one, of course, which court? But two, who are you going to litigate it against? Are you saying you litigate it against the uh, British government? And why are you asking the British government to try and enforce rights of the people of Sabah and Sarawak when we are already independent? So legally speaking, when people say, let's go and litigate it, I suspect a lot of that kind of sentiment is more political than legal. So to answer your first question very clearly, all the provisions or all the enforceable provisions of the Malaysian Agreement are already in our constitution. If you want to litigate matters in the constitution of Sabah and Sarawak, regarding Sabah and Sarawak, you need to use the federal constitution and you need to use the Malaysian courts. Since this is basically a constitutional question, I'm assuming you're saying that if there's an issue, you litigate something that is in the constitution, this will have to go up to the federal court, am I right? You can go to the federal court or if it's a matter of declar declaring a law or an executive action unconstitutional, you can start at the high court. So you have two options. But your defendant is the Malaysian government. Mm. Your mm. plaintiff will be the Sabah government. That is the point I've been stressing. The problem with Malaysia has been that we have had for many years one government controlling federal and one government controlling Sabah. So when people talk about, yeah, let's go and litigate against federal, then the practical question comes up, do we litigate against the same government? One. Number two, if it was the same government, federal, 
same type of government or same party in power or same coalition, a lot of the provisions of the constitution say that in respect of Sabah, only the Sabah State Legislative Assembly is allowed to approve it. Only, it will only be law if the Sabah Legislative Assembly has approved it. So everything that has happened in Sabah has been approved by the Sabah State Legislative Assembly. If the people want to rise up against the government, they need to go back to the Sabah Parliament and revise those laws. So, so you're I'm saying that the problem is at the Sabah that. level, Sabah Sarat level rather than Putrajaya? On certain things. If you talk about religion, if you talk about language, these are matters that are already in the constitution, number one. Number two, these are matters that if, if they were changed, were changed by the Sabah government then, by the Sabah parliament then. We need to go and change and reverse it there first. The only thing I see for litigation is the one that I've been talking about, the 40% financial grant. 11C, 112C, 112D, part 4, part 5. That 40% is something that is expressly stated already in the federal constitution that allows the Sabah state government to initiate with the federal government a review of that. There has been no review since 1974. Sabah has been given a fixed grant, and to me wrongly, and the Sabah government has not really done anything uh, on it. The Barisa National Government, before the Pakatan Harapan Government, I understand, set up a special committee, and that special committee was supposedly advising Prime Minister. And then under the Pakatan Government, I understand from uh, some statements, that committee has sort of completed its work. I'm not sure where that status is, because if Federal and Sabah want to talk about it and negotiate, that's fine. That, that doesn't involve the courts. But if they cannot negotiate it, it is expressly stated in the federal constitution that you need to go to an international assessor on that grant. So don't confuse the two matters. When people talk about international arbitration, when people talk about international assessor, they use the word assessor, or international judge, let's say, we are only talking about that in terms of the 40% financial grant. Meaning if federal and Sabah do not agree on the 40%, do we increase, do we reduce, do we take into account what grants have we already been given to you? Bring it to the international arbitration or ar uh, international assessor. Only that part is allowed for international uh, um, tribunal, uh, tribunal decision. But that process hasn't really even started. When people are negotiating, when Sabah and federal government are negotiating, they can continue to negotiate. But I, I believe Sabah government has not sent a letter of demand to say to the federal government, look, I need to backdate what you owe me since 1974, or at least moving forward. This is the sum. This is how I calculated it. If the federal government does not agree, then you litigate it in the international fora with an international assessor. And that international assessor's decision will be binding. Mm -hmm. So, so you're saying that basically the only one that's clear cut case where there is an opportunity to take it to a forum outside Malaysia is the 40%. You know, right, in Sabah, they've actually also tried to, to litigate on this idea of modernization. But one of the things they face from local court is the issue of local stand, standing. Uh, the two persons right, litigate it could not get it beyond the initial hearing. The other area that people always talk about litigating is actually the uh, oil and gas resources. But of course, they're not formally part of the MS-63. They're more to do with the PDA-74. Can I get yeah. your legal opinion on these two issues? Yeah, so the bonionization litigation, again, we need to look at what really is the issue. I don't see what people mean by bonionization. Because if you want to look at bonionization, your rights in Sabah and Sarah, for the people of Sabah and Sarah, must be embedded in the constitution. You litigate that. If there's any problem, if the law is unconstitutional, let's say, let's say the law... Um, that needs Sabah Parliament, that Sabah Parliament or Sabah State Government, and uh, Sabah, sorry, Sabah Legislative Assembly did not give that approval for that change of law. Then, of course, you go to the federal court and you say this is unconstitutional. But when you talk about bonionization in terms of a political concept, 
that is for politicians to speak about. And no, no, no. In, in here, here, when when they talk about right, basically the common understanding in the guy in the street, bonanization means that uh, the people of Sabah and the people of Sarawak will be given a major post in the government to replace the expatriate. In other words, a sort of an acceleration of people from Borneo into the state administration. The argument is that in the specific case of Sabah, uh, too many uh, non-Sabahans were appointed to senior positions when uh, local Sabahans could have been appointed. Yeah, so the, there's no real bar in the constitution as to the numbers or no quota fixed. The only argument that you want to make is that it, there may be some form of discrimination in terms of capability and, and, and service level. So that's an issue you take up with federal, but it's more of an executive um, discretion or executive policy. You need to change that in terms of how the bureaucracy works. It's not so much the law as in the constitution. So even if you litigate on this issue, it's very likely that you will not succeed because it's seen unless as an executive thing. Yeah, unless you, you show that there is a real clear-cut case of discrimination against the natives of Sabah and Sarawak. And under Article 8, there's discrimination based on gender, sex, uh, disability, and so forth. Very difficult. What about the issue of PDA 74? The activists in Sabah and Sarawak said that PDA 74 cannot be valid uh, simply because something as important as oil and gas resources, uh, it has to be approved, not by the Tuan Menteri, the Chief Minister, but has to have gone through the Sabah Dewan Undangan Negeri or Sarawak Dewan Undangan Negeri. In other yeah, words, the so Chief the Minister issue, did not the, have the authority to sign. So this is the issue, right? There are two issues. One, one issue is the agreement as to all royalty. The, that one issue on the agreement to all royalty is clear from the constitution that Sabah has a right to that all royalty. And I've said also before that you know not all the, the, the percentages are being given properly, but because there was an agreement to the fixed sum. So when you challenge the fixed sum, that question then becomes a question whether there was competency on the part of the Sabah government then to agree to the fixed sum. So my uh, understanding was that that fixed sum, because there is an agreement, that agreement sort of superseded the way that the constitution calculates the all royalty for Sabah. So two things can be done. One, you renegotiate that agreement. If you do not want to renegotiate that agreement, then you have to say that whatever is fixed in the constitution of Sabah and how it's calculated, supersedes that agreement. You have to declare that that agreement has been invalidly, uh, is unconstitutional, it's against the constitution. The second question, and I think there was a challenge that has been taken out by Sarawak uh, on, uh, in the federal court. Federal court did not give leave, I think, that the act is unconstitutional. is actually sort of a red herring. The more important act that we need to look at is the act on how you uh, decipher, how you calculate the continental shelf of Sabah. And that has been, that was, uh, that was really governed very much by the emergency ordinance, where federal could actually extract all from a larger area of Sabah. So that, that, that area is going to be very technical, but your, the, the answer to that really is to look at how you demarcate where is Sabah's shores, that then you say, okay, this is Sabah's and this is our all royalty. So the question, for the second question, the more difficult question is a geographical question. And I believe it's the Continental Shelf Act. That should be the one that allows for, or that, that, that's an entry point for more litigation on that. But, but you haven't answered the question whether you think that the PDA can be declared illegal because the chief minister doesn't have the right to sign it. It's not the competent authority. Uh, if you ask me, I, I, if you ask me, I think the PDPA is not unconstitutional. The question really is how you then calculate, as I said, the, 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 the land area mm, and the, the, mm. the sea area. Mm. Because if you had, on my first argument, if you had said, okay, I'm going to agree to uh, less all royalty based on the PDPA, then it's a state government decision. When you want to say this state government decision was wrong, then what you have to do is you, do, you have to declare all the acts invalid, or, or sorry, all the decisions uh, made 
in, in, from, from, from time of agreement to be invalid. And it is a very, very difficult um, uh, point to make uh, when the state government has actually agreed to something that was much less or, or, or a different form of calculation if you were following the constitution. Have you heard of a thing called the Chagos case? No. No, okay. Anyway, to move along, my, my last question is this. Um, uh, there are a lot of people in, 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 in Sabah and Sarawak who are of the opinion that uh, it is uh, very difficult to, to uh, uh, litigate this in the Malaysian courts because uh, the Malaysian courts tend to, uh, what is it called? tend to support the state. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, if there's no legal remedy, say both at the international arena, as you hinted, and limited remedy at the domestic law, right? Then does this mean that this issue really has to be resolved at a political level? Because what we have seen is that since independence, uh, the fact that we have this level of unhappiness in Sabah and Sarawak suggests that the political solution has not worked. Yeah, so if you give me all those assumptions and you say, yeah, if, 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 then the simple answer is yes. What the judges like to say when we go and, and talk about, you know, sometimes borderline political issues is go back to the ballot box. This is not for the judges to decide. Mm -hmm. So I want to just say that when politicians anywhere you keep saying, I will fight for the rights of Sabahans, I will fight for the rights of Sarawakians, then you ask them, what actually are you fighting for? You're actually fighting for things in the constitution. Then you ask them, what is it in the constitution that you're fighting for? Are you fighting for language? Are you fighting for more uh, 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 space in the civil service? Are you fighting for religion? If you're fighting for these things, then the, you need to drill down and ask, okay, what has happened for all these years where the Sabah government, whichever government was in power, what did they do? What were the laws that were passed? More importantly, for example, I think, and it's all over in Malaysia, right? In Malaysia and Sabah and Sarawak, it's really the rights of the natives, rights of orang asli, orang asal. I think that's something that people always ignore or, or people do, do not talk about. If we want to talk about affirmative action for the natives and the orang asli and orang asal, then those are things that don't necessarily need to be litigated. But what you need to do as a state government is to protect the forests, to protect the lands, to protect the boundaries, mm. as opposed to allowing all of their lands and the natives' uh, uh, customary rights and custom and culture be overrun by you know big projects. I think that is something that immediately can be done by the Sarawak government or Sarawak government. I think that's more important. Mm. Um, but when politicians come and talk about language and religion and all those other things, yeah, it's, it sounds really nice, incites the people, it, it creates a resistance movement. But then when you look at a bit more detail and ask, what really are you fighting for? Tell me where does it say in the constitution you're fighting for? It's very hard, to, very hard, to, it's very hard for them to answer because the simple answer is, look, your previous uh, legislative assembly had approved this. Your state government had agreed to this. And, and, and the only thing that you're looking at is probably the 40%. That probably is a, 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 the, the, the greatest hope to me uh, for the moment. And on top of the 40%, not just what is current, you backdate it, number one. Number two, look at um, all the royalties and all the other petroleum taxes and the levies that have been may, may be there may be a short change on it, um, and those are the things, the, the numbers. All right, one final question before I, I let you go. Uh, the final thing is 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 sort of the statement made by a lot of uh, uh, people, especially the middle class. Increasingly, the narrative now in in Sabah and Sarawak among the activists is that. This whole uh, Malaysia experiment was an illegal experiment in the sense that at the time, uh, North Borneo and Sarawak decided to, to, to join or establish the Federation of Malaysia. Uh, they were a colonial people and therefore they were not competent that the whole cobalt process uh, is invalid because you cannot ask a colonial people or people who are colonized you know, to decide on their future. Is This will have been decided by London. So therefore, because of that, this whole Malaysia uh, Federation is invalid. Can, can I have a legal opinion on it? Just a legal opinion. I think legally, you know, there was the IGC report. They had consultations. They had views that, you know, there should be some uh, sort of separation subject to conditions. I think that kind of argument is more, you know, it's an argument that I don't really accept. But for, if you're a politician, if you are somebody that wants to talk about these issues, then it's nice to talk about. But legally, it's really difficult to say that a colonized people or underdeveloped people or, you know, who, 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 the, the British or the white people like to call us primitive, right? Um, 
<laughs> that, that we never had our brains or our agency to be able to enter into that kind of context. I think that's that's insulting us, you know, and I think we wanted that kind of independence. So, you know, we have to um, uh, keep to that. Uh, Kelantan, uh, in 1963, after the entering into of the 1963 agreement, actually challenged the agreement. Yes. Uh, Last minute challenge. That, yeah, and, and that challenge lost. So I think that was one of the few cases or the only case on the 63 agreement. It's going to be very difficult um, to say that that agreement is not void just because we don't, we are not competent to enter into that agreement. Mm. I think that kind of argument really should stop because it actually makes all of us look really stupid. All our grandfathers, great grandfathers, all predecessors who had decided to ask for independence subject to conditions uh, look really dumb. All right. Well, thank you very much, Edmund. I think that was an interesting and, and, and a stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, I really hope to speak to you again when new, new developments appear on the horizon. Thank you very much, Edmund. Thank you, James.